Heavenly Father, as we continue on in this study, we once again plead that you would bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, your angels, to guide and direct what we're discussing. And as we think back over the past couple days, we know that we've dealt with a lot of material and um, a lot of concept, a lot of truths. We ask that you would give us the ability to uh, retain these things, that we can test them on our own time, in our own study, and through prayer. After these meetings close, please continue to guide and direct in what's spoken from up front. Um, let everything be done for your glory and honor, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Um, we're, we're on page 92, uh, we've already started into this. We started, uh, on Friday night, emphasizing some basic principles that we were going to uh, use as we went through this weekend. One of them is there in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happen as an example of the end of the world. Um, and we also dealt with the function of the book of Revelation and Daniel and Revelation combined. And its book of Revelation is the point of reference for bringing the lines of prophecy together at the end of the world. And in the book of Revelation, modern Babylon, Revelation 16, 19, it's divided into three parts. And uh, in 1619, it says the great city was divided into three parts. And you'll see a city underneath there and you'll see several references just from Revelation. There are other references in the Bible, but just in Revelation, you can see all the different verses that confirm that a city represents a kingdom in Bible prophecy. So when you're looking at Revelation 16, 19, and it says the great city, it's talking about the the kingdom of Babylon at the end of the world is divided into three parts. This is standard understanding for Adventism. And then you see verses 12 and 13 identifying that these parts are the beast, the dragon, and false prophet. On the next page, you see Sister White. Um, you know, we mentioned just briefly yesterday, that, or maybe Friday night, we mentioned that in the pioneer time period, there were three tests. Brothers and sisters, we don't have time to deal with this. On the Prophecy School DVDs or videotapes or audio tapes, the 40 hours of the Prophecy School, we deal with this subject in depth. One of the most serious truths that comes out of an understanding of the Millerite time period is that there was a threefold testing process during that history. It's not just in early writings, page 259, but that's one of the easiest places to see. You go to early writings 259, Sister White identified a threefold testing process in the time period of Christ. And as soon as she finishes that paragraph, she goes into the Millerite time period and she points out three tests in the time period of the Millerites. The threefold testing process in the time period of Christ, John the Baptist was the first test. And in that paragraph, she says, all those who rejected the teachings of John could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. If you, if the first test was John the Baptist, if you didn't accept what John the Baptist was saying, you couldn't be benefited by Jesus. What's that mean? You're lost. So the first test is life or death. And then the second test um, took place in the time of Christ. The third test, when she's in that paragraph, she ends up saying... uh, because the Jews flunked the third test, they weren't prepared to take their faith into the heavenly sanctuary, and they were left in perfect darkness. That's her word, left in perfect darkness. And as soon as she finishes that commentary on the history of Christ, she goes into the first, second, and third angel's message during the Millerite time period. And she, the first test, first angel's message, William Miller. William Miller, she compares with, not in early writings 259, but William Miller is a type of John the Baptist. He was a A reformer, that was the first test. A reformer was the first test in the time period of Christ. William Miller brought a reform message. He's the symbol of the first test in the Millerite time period. And if you rejected William Miller's message, then hey, you flunked the first test. But if you accepted William Miller's message and you continued with the Millerite movement until the point in time in 1842 where the organized churches began to close their doors and the second test came into history, the second angel's message, then if the peer pressure of the organized churches saying, you know, you guys are a bunch of fanatics. If if you agreed with the organized churches and separated from the Millerite movement, you flunked the second test. And the third test is where the door closes. October 22nd, 1844, the door closed into the holy place. Um, Philadelphian 
message, the door closed, and the parable of the ten virgins. The third test is where the door closes in these histories. And the point is, is we've been emphasizing that this parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter, Sister White says, in the Millerite time period, but it's going to be fulfilled again to the very letter at the end of the world. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have three tests at the end of the world, and we haven't spent any time on that. We're not going to. I'm just going to point it out for you. The first test for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world is the spirit of prophecy, a reform message, the whole message of Ellen White. That's why Sister White says, all those Seventh-day Adventists that take their stand under Satan's banner, and when does the Seventh-day Adventist take their stand under Satan's banner? At the Sunday Law. And by context, if you look what she's talking about, the Sunday Law is where we will take our stand under Satan's banner. And she says this, all those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under, under Satan's banner will first give up their confidence in the testimonies of God's Spirit. The first place we flunk is on the subject of Ellen White. If we reject Ellen White, we flunk the first test. We're not involved with the second or the third test. The third test is the Sunday Law. That's where the door closes for Adventists. The second test, as you look at the second test, the second test, of course, precedes the third test. And as you look at the different areas in Scripture where these three tests are illustrated, because they're not simply illustrated in the days of Christ and the Millerite movement, this, these tests are illustrated throughout Scripture. The test that precedes the third test. The third test is where the door closes. So the test that precedes the third test is... The second test has certain characteristics of itself. I'll give you another history where these three tests were. Noah brought a message of reform. Noah is a type of Elijah. He's a type of William Miller. He's a type of Ellen White. A reform message. Was there a door that closed in the story of Noah? Yes, the ark. So in between the preaching of Noah and the closing of the ark, there was a second test. The characteristic of a second test is that it's a visual test. It's a visual test. Was probation still open when the animals were getting on the ark? Yeah. Well, yeah, but that was a test. That was the second test. The test that precedes the closing of the door in these three tests is a visual test. Sister White um, compares the midnight cry in the Millerite time period with the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. That's, that's the history she goes to to explain uh, the midnight cry. And what did Jesus say in the triumphal entry when the Pharisees were saying, make these children quit crying out? He says, if these children don't cry out, the very rocks will cry out. It was a visual thing. The, the Pharisees were seeing this take place. And in the Millerite time period, in Second Angel, the Midnight Cry, the organized churches, they didn't just close their door on the Millerites. They began putting in the newspaper, these guys are crazy fanatics. They began telling their flock, don't go see them. It was a visual thing. You could see it taking place. And uh, the visual test for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world is a combination of church and state that takes place in the United States. There's a passage where Sister White plainly says it. She says, The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast, which Sister White defines as the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. She says it in a variety of ways. There's only one definition of the image of the beast in inspiration. Combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. So Sister White has a statement in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 976, I believe. She says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. And probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists at the Sunday Law. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test they must pass before they are sealed. Brothers and sisters, when do we receive the seal of God? At the Sunday Law Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214. We receive the seal of God at the Sunday Law. Probation closes at the Sunday Law. And Sister White says there's a test that comes before probation closes, before we receive the seal of God, that it has something to do with the image of the beast that our eternal destiny will be decided upon. It's a visual test. It's a visual test. It's well, almost over. It's almost over. The coming together of church and state in the United States is almost over. If you look at the National Reform Movement in Sister White's day and age, when she spoke about the National Reform Movement, the organization that was pushing for a Sunday law, if you read very carefully what she said about it, she described certain characteristics associated with the National Reform Movement in her day and age that was pushing for a Sunday law. And you realize that every one of those characteristics that she identifies about the National Reform Movement are the characteristics of the Christian Coalition Movement. Dead on. By the way, 
When did the Christian Coalition movement begin as an organization? When did Pat Robertson incorporate the Christian Coalition movement? 1989, the same year that verse 40 of Daniel 11 was fulfilled, the image of the beast test begun in the United States. Now, there was stuff that went on before 1989, but 1989 is the line in the sand because this is the modern counterpart of the national reform movement getting underway. And Pat Robertson has identified a handful of goals for the Christian Coalition. His first goal was they're going to put a voting representative in every precinct, voting precinct in the United States. Formed in 1989. By 1994, the Christian Coalition had represented every voting precinct in the United States. The Republican and Democratic Party in 200 years have never accomplished that. They accomplished it in five years. In a 1994 election, the Christian Coalition took control of the Congress of the United States and should. The next goal was to take control of the Congress of the United States, which they accomplished in 1994. And from that point on, since 1994, should the members in the Congress of the United States that were put there through the efforts of the Christian Coalition unite with the Catholics that are in the Congress, they've had the votes for a Sunday law and enough to override a presidential veto since 1995 when they were sworn in in January. Every election since then, they have grown stronger. The third goal, stated public goal for Pat Robertson, was to put a president in the White House that was sympathetic with them. To me, it's under the thumb of that. He took office in the year 2000. His next, their next stated goal was to take control of the Supreme Court of the United States, brothers and sisters. That happened about four days ago. Four days ago. There's only one other stated goal of the Christian coalition, according to Pat Robertson. He says it like this. There is no separation of church and state in the Constitution, and when we have the votes, we're taking over. Brothers and sisters, they've had the votes since 1994. All the goals have been met. The only goal left is the Sunday law because we know a Seventh-day Adventist it's a Sunday law where the Constitution is destroyed. The second test, the image of the beast test, the coming together of church and state, which began in verse 40, being fulfilled in 1989, is almost over. So I want you to know that when we're talking about these three tests in the Millerite time period, that when you bring that history down to the end, there are some serious things to understand about what's going on in the world today. But the first test is Ellen White. And brothers and sisters, I know everyone in this room understands this like I do, but I want to emphasize, Ellen White is just as much a prophet as any of the prophets in the Bible, period, period. And here in page 93, Sister White's talking about the beast, dragon, and the false prophet. She's a prophet. John was a prophet, John the Revelator. When he sees the threefold kingdom of Babylon at the end of the world, he says it's divided into three parts, the beast, dragon, and the false prophet. And you see this quote here, Sister White says, sees this same threefold kingdom, but she does not call it the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. She calls it Catholicism, spiritualism, and apostate Protestantism. Two prophets describing the, the same power at the end of the world, but using different words to express and identify that power. That's the, that's the work of a student of prophecy, is to bring the different prophets' testimonies together in the book of Revelation, where they agree, support, and expand the information that is found in the book of Revelation. Um, so, in uh, page 93, when you look, and this is very summarized on a, on, on a study that is in the prophecy school, much deeper. When you look at Daniel 11.41, you see Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon escaping the hand of the papacy. In verse 42 of Daniel 11, you see the word escape. And in verse 41, you see the word escape, but they're two different Hebrew words, two different Hebrew words. This brother in Oklahoma, Frank Hardy, that was presenting his understanding of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the, the brother that had the master thesis on the last six verses of Daniel 11, he was, he was a scholar. He was one of these people that if you open the Old Testament and the King James Bible and you read a verse, he can tell you what that verse is in Hebrew right then and there. And if you do it in the New Testament, he can tell you what it is in Greek. I mean, he knows... The biblical languages, you just, you, you know, wouldn't you like to have that gift? <laughs> and uh, so, to me, one of the most important verses in Daniel eleven forty to 45 is the word escape in verse 41. It's different than the word escape in verse 42. In verse 42, the word Hebrew word that's translated as escape mean, means finding no deliverance. But in verse 41, the word escape means escape as if by slipperiness. It's like when you reach into a bucket of water and grab a bar of soap 
and it slips out of your hand. And the primary definition of this word escape in verse 41 is this understanding that whatever slips out of your hand has previously been in your hand. That's the main intent of the word escape in verse 41. That's how I always describe it. That's how I always describe it. So when I'm describing this word escape at this meeting in Oklahoma, Brother Hardy, who's who's got a different understanding of the last six verses than I do, but he understands the Hebrew and Greek better than... I can't even do 1% of what he understands about the Hebrew and Greek. I gave the definition as I just gave it to you. And he says, that's right. This word escape in verse 41, the main understanding of this escape is that whatever is escaping, when this Hebrew word is using, whatever, whatever is escaping from whatever it's escaping from, the main intent is that it's been previously under the control of what it's escaping from. So in verse 41, when you see Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon escaping the hand of the papacy, it means that prior to verse 41, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon have been in the hand of the papacy. In verse 41, it's where they escape. When you understand that all the prophets agree with one another, 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets, and you realize that in Daniel 12, 1, human probation closes. So therefore, verse 41 of Daniel 11 is right at the end of the world. Then Daniel, in verse 41, when he's talking about the glorious land getting conquered, he's talking about the glorious land getting conquered right at the end of the world, at the end of time. He's in the history illustrated of the book of, book of Revelation. So when he says, at the Sunday law in the United States, I see Edom, Moab, and, the, and the Ammon, and I see people coming out of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, that's simply Daniel using Edom, Moab, and Ammon to symbolize the threefold union of modern Babylon, the beast, dragon, and false prophet. Because when the Sunday law hits in the United States, the message goes out, come out of Babylon. And those of God's children that are in the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, or Edom, Moab, and Ammon, at that point in time, they escape the hand of the papacy. The prophet's... Many of the prophets describe this threefold division of modern Babylon, but they don't use beast, dragon, and false prophet. They're different prophets. Sister White didn't use it. She did sometimes, but she also called it spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, Catholicism. Daniel's simply using different words to express the same truth. And you, say, you see these same three words in, in Isaiah eleven fourteen. The only difference in Isaiah eleven fourteen, if you read very carefully... In verse 16 and 17 of Isaiah 11, you see the final deliverance of God's people illustrated because it's talking about the remnant, um, a way being prepared to cross the river or the waters just like ancient Israel came out of Egypt. It's clearly a symbol of the final deliverance. And in verse 14, just two verses before all this takes place, Isaiah is talking about Edom, Moab, and Ammon, not the chief of the children of Ammon, just Ammon, coming and standing with God's people. So Isaiah is describing the final people that come out of Babylon just before human probation closes. And Daniel's describing the very first people to come out of Babylon at the Sunday Law in the United States, because that's where it begins. The Sunday Law in the United States and all the other countries are confronted with the Sunday Law test. And finally, Michael stands up and human probation closes. So when Isaiah is describing this time period and this vision of Isaiah in chapter 11, it begins in Isaiah 10, verse 1. And Isaiah 10, verse 1 says, Woe unto them that make unrighteous decrees. And Sister White says the unrighteous decree of Isaiah 10, 1 is the Sunday law. So we know that Isaiah 10, 1 is the Sunday law. And chapter 10, chapter 11 is just the events that take place after the Sunday law. And the end of chapter 11 is the final deliverance of God's people. And one of the last things Isaiah is describing is the final people that come out of Babylon on the fourth angel's message call out of Babylon. And to symbolize Babylon at that point, Isaiah uses Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Daniel's describing the first people to come out of Babylon, and he uses Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. That's the only difference is the word chief. So what does chief mean? First fruits. First fruits. Daniel's using Edom, Moab, and Ammon to describe the very first people that come out of Babylon at the Sunday Law crisis in the United States. In um, the rebuilding of Jerusalem which Sister White says the rebuilding of Jerusalem that took place after the children of Israel came out of captivity in Babylon symbolizes the work of Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world. She says that more than once. In that work, 
How many enemies were raised up to resist the work? Was it two or four? It was three. It was Sambalot, Sambalot, Tobiah, and Gresham. So who are the three enemies that are resisting the work of Israel in that story that parallels the work of modern Israel? Who are they? Who's, who's Tobiah, Gresham, and Sambalat? It's the beast, the dragon, the false prophet. Easy. E- easy. In Numbers 22, just before the children of Israel go into the promised land, how hard is that to see as an illustration of the end of the world? Just before literal Israel's going to go into the promised land is clearly an illustration of of modern Israel, just before the final deliverance, right? How many enemies were raised up to resist the entrance of ancient Israel in the Promised Land? Was it two or four? It was three. It was three. You can... Moab, Midian, and Balaam. At the cross, which is is a symbol of the end of the world in many ways, the world is divided in how many parts? Four or two? Three. Because above the cross is a title of Christ, being the King of the Jews, And it's in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And in the stories of of the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and in number 22, those three enemies are telling the story of how modern Babylon attacks modern Israel. That's what it's about. With the story of Tobiah, Sambalak, and Gresham, in Numbers 22, it's a story about how modern Babylon attacks and opposes the work of modern Israel. In the story of Daniel 11 and Isaiah 11, it's not talking about how modern Babylon attacks modern Israel. It's talking about how God's other children that are in Babylon are called out of Babylon. The different lines of prophecy do not teach the same thing. They build upon one another. They, they expand the story. And at the cross, it's not talking about how modern Babylon makes inroads on modern Israel at the end of the world. Nor is it talking about those people in Babylon that get called out. It's talking about um, the work that is accomplished by Christ that provides opportunity for all of us to come out of Babylon and receive salvation. All these different lines of prophecy establish different truths in connection with modern Babylon at the end of the world. So when you come to the three Elijahs, three Elijahs with Jezebel, Ahab, and the prophets of Baal, you see the beast, the dragon, and false prophet. But it's not talking about how modern Babylon attacks the Seventh-day Adventist church at the, world, at the end of the world. It's giving us a, a very specific structure of who they are. Jezebel represents an impure church. Ahab, a civil power, a civil structure that confronts the whole world. The prophets of Baal, a deceiving power. Revelation 13 says the, the United States deceives the world, but it doesn't really do a dance. Its deception is identified as using military and economic strength to force the world to do what it wants. And we've seen it. If you've looked, if you've been watching, it's been going on for 30, 40 years. The country doesn't do what the United States wants. First, they they exercise economic embargoes upon them. I mean, it was a little, I was a little boy, and I'm pretty old now, but while while I was a little boy is when they first started putting economic embargoes on Cuba. Sanctions. Sanctions. If, they, if the country doesn't do what they want from the economic sanctions, then what do they do? They go in with their bombers. Military and economic strength has been being exercised increasingly, increasingly more by the United States over the past 30, 40 years. Look what they're talking about Iran right now. And with the whole world, let's put some economic embargoes on them, see if we can stop their uh, nuclear ambitions. But if they don't, well, what's going to happen? Bush is ready to strike. Um, That's the deception, prophetic deception that the United States is going to do according to Revelation 13. It's describing the characteristics of their work, the characteristics of the civil power. um, Is it's a civil structure? It's a civil structure. These are the same characteristics um, that are found in other illustrations of this threefold power. One of them that we've looked at already, and I've mentioned, but I'll mention it again. Brothers and sisters, The year 330 symbolizes a time period when the papacy received the city of Rome. It was seated in the city of Rome, and it's emphasizing that at the end, in the threefold alliance, Rome is going to be seated, be the one controlling the situation. So was Jezebel in control of Ahab? Yeah, Ahab wasn't the the husband 
that was the leader in the family, Jezebel was. Was Ahab controlling the, the prophets of Baal? Or, I mean, Jezebel controlling the prophets of Baal? Yes. See, in this story, Jezebel's pulling all the strings. How about Herodias? Herodias. Did she, did she deceive Herod with her daughter? Yes. I mean, now, at, the, at Carmel, when the battle between the prophets of Baal and Elijah were going on, was Jezebel there? No, she was back in Samaria, right? She was behind the scenes. In the story of John the Baptist, was Herodias there at the, the birthday party for Herod? No. See, both these women are pulling the strings, but they're behind the scenes. They're behind the scenes, but they're pulling the strings. This is just what's going on in the world today, brothers and sisters. Just what's going on in the world today. Um, there's all kinds of truths to pull out of this. But this is just another illustration of the threefold um, breakup of modern Babylon. Um, let, me, let me show you a couple more truths so you'll perhaps start seeing the significance of this. The, the civil power, the United Nations... In Revelation 17, these ten kings are the United Nations. In Revelation 17, it says the seventh kingdom, which by, if you read very carefully, Revelation 17, and all this is on the prophecy schools. If, if you haven't been through Revelation 17 carefully, carefully recently and you want to see an interesting study, I recommend to you the prophecy school. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I am trying to encourage you to study these things out. Revelation 17, you can show from the language without a doubt, whoever you identify the ten kings as, There are a lot of ideas on who the Ten Kings are. It's the United Nations. But whoever you identify them as, it's obviously the Seventh Kingdom. What I mean, Seventh Kingdom, in Revelation 17, there's five kings that have fallen. One is, one is yet to come, and the eighth is of the seven. And as you go through there very carefully, the Seventh Kingdom is these ten kings. And it says they receive a kingdom. It doesn't say they receive kingdoms. So if you're thinking those ten kings are the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome, can't be because the ten kingdoms of pagan Rome in Daniel 7 received one kingdom each, which is ten kingdoms. And in Revelation 17, these ten kingdoms have received no kingdom, singular, as of yet. These are ten kings that receive one kingdom. And it says that they agree to give their kingdom, the seventh kingdom, (laughs) unto the beast, the papacy. There's an agreement struck that they give their kingdom the seventh kingdom, to the papacy. And it says they rule one hour with the beast, a co-reigning. So what is this? This is the marriage between Jezebel and Ahab. This is the marriage, the civil power coming together with the church power at the end of the world. And these ten kings, Ahab's the, the king of the ten northern tribes. So in history, there was a time when the civil power gave its civil authority to the papacy. That was the year 533. Justinian gave the civil authority of the Roman Empire over to the papacy. The pioneers all speak about this. He did it in a legal document. Justinian's decree. Most of the pioneers that write about this include the decree in their writing. It was that significant to people like James White, Uriah Smith, uh, A.T. Jones, although Jones wasn't a pioneer. But this decree was important, and we don't know about it here at the end of the world very much. But in the decree, the two primary important things that happened is the emperor of Rome identified that the pope of Rome was the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. Here's what I I hope you'll understand. If you go back to when the historians or the pioneers are speaking about this, they point out that Justinian, the civil power of the Roman Empire, his kingdom's fallen apart. It's fallen apart. This is the year 533. The trumpets... The first four trumpets have already taken Western Rome away from them. In 476, the city of Rome was no longer controlled by Rome. He'd lost half his empire in 476. So we're 50 years after that, 60 years, in the year 533. And the trumpet powers of Revelation are just continuing to take his kingdom apart, piece by piece. So he's got problems. He's got problems. And that's what verse 30 of Daniel 11 is speaking about, too. If you look at Uriah Smith, that's... His struggles uh, to try to maintain his kingdoms in verse 30. So in the midst of trying to maintain his political kingdom as it's being taken apart, there's a religious controversy going on. Is the church at Rome the preeminent church or is the church in Constantinople the preeminent church? Which is the the leading Christian church? And he decides it's politically expedient for him to decide to select the Roman church as the head of all the churches and the corrector of heretics. Because this, is, in his mind, is going to give him more strength to keep his kingdom together. So what I'm suggesting to you here, brothers and sisters, is that there's a role for Islam in Bible prophecy. Islam 
is the power that brings the world to its knees, brings about the Sunday laws, and brings the catastrophes at the end of the world. Now, I haven't had time to explain that yet, but Islam has a role to play. Islam is what brings the third woe into the history of the world. It, it arrived prophetically on 9-11. You can show that. You can show that. But in any case, what I want you to see is that at the end of the world, the world is going to be brought to its knees by radical Islam. That's what Bible prophecy teaches. It's going to be brought to its knees by radical Islam, and the world's going to be looking for a way out of this mal- mess. The United States is going to insist that the world accept a one-world government. Why do I say that? Revelation 13. Revelation 13. In verse 14, the United States goes out to the world, and it says, commands the world to set up an image of the beast. There's only one definition of the image of the beast and inspiration. It's the combination of church and state with the church in control. And in verse 14 of Revelation 13, the United States tells the world to set up an image of the beast. That's a world image of the beast. By definition, it means a one world government. Combination of church and state in the world. The United States is going to be brought to its knees by radical Islam. It's going to t- go to the United Nations and to the world and say, look, the only way we can deal with Iran and bin Laden and what's going on is if we bring the world under a one-world government, all the countries surrender their national sovereignty, and the world's going to say, no way, we can't trust a cowboy like George Bush or whoever's the president when it takes place. We don't like the United States, and they don't. They don't like the United States. They're also going to say, we don't have any confidence in the United Nations. But the world's going to say, we do have confidence in the Pope of Rome. And the United Nations, the Ten Kings, they're going to agree to give their kingdom to the beast. Why? Because their whole empire is falling apart around them, just like Justinian. And because there's a religious crisis. What's the religious crisis? It's radical Islam. And it's, the Pope of Rome is going to be identified once again as the corrector of heretics, along with being the head of the churches. Under one head, we read it, the whole world will be directed. Now, now notice this. Notice this from this story. Yeah, notice this from this story. I want to pull one more punchline in here. After the, the, the victory at Carmel, and Ahab runs back to Samaria to tell Jezebel, you won't believe it. Elijah's God is the true God. Did he think Jezebel was going to say, Elijah's going to be dead by this time tomorrow? No. He thought Jezebel was going to say, really, I want to become a Christian too. Ahab was deceived. He was deceived. Ahab's the civil power. He's deceived. Was Herod deceived? Did he think Salome... After he said, up to half my kingdom, I'll give you for that wonderful dance. Did he think Salome was going to say what I want for the dance? Is John the Baptist's head in a basket? In both these stories, the civil power is deceived. The deception's already going on in the world. Here's the deception. You can see it already in the world. When they captured Saddam Hussein, there was an argument that erupted. You know what the argument was? The Europeans, the United Nations, said we want... Saddam Hussein tried in the world court because we do not believe in the death penalty. Remember that argument? The United States and Iraq said, we want him tried in Iraq or the United States because we believe in the death penalty and he needs to die. That argument went on right after they captured Saddam Hussein. You know what the papacy came out during that time period and did? Papacy came out and said, we agree with the United Nations. We do not believe in the death penalty. Do you think that the papacy doesn't believe in the death penalty? You see, when when the United Nations agrees to give their kingdom to the papacy because the world's falling apart and there's a religious crisis, based on the story of Elijah, the United Nations, once it does that, it's going to be deceived. And the deception is this. Number one, the papacy does believe in the death penalty. And number two, the papacy could care less about radical Islam. It wants to deal with faithful Seventh-day Adventists. It's already going on in the world today, brothers and sisters. this, This movement... It's already taking place before our very eyes. So when you see the beast, dragon, and false prophet illustrated at different points in Scripture, they're telling different, different particulars about the role, the, the purpose, the design of these three powers, their, their, their relationship to one another. And the year 533, when pagan Rome, the dragon in Revelation 13, verse 2 when the dragon pagan Rome gave its authority to the papacy is pointing forward to the time when the United Nations agrees to give its authority to the beast 
And brothers and sisters, this was foundational understanding for Seventh-day Adventists, but we don't understand these things any longer. And we need to understand these things because those histories are what identify what's going on in the world today. It's wake-up time. Our message, we're, we're now moving into number 11. How many of you have been here the whole weekend? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have not only heard the quote up here and read it yourself, where we've emphasized, inspiration emphasizes, that the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter in the Millerite time period, but it's going to be repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world? How many heard that and understand that? Okay. For me... The, the more I look at the Millerite time period from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, the more I see that there are this, the things that took place there are, even some of the, the mundane things are repeated to the very letter. Let me give you an example from this book. This, I, I don't know that anyone ever gets this, it impacts them the way it impacts me. In this book, when he goes through the history of the Millerite time period. He points out that there was a, a, a theological argument going on with the different groups that were making up the Millerite movement. Okay? If you remember the vision by Sister White where she was taken to the Earth Made New and she's seen Brother Stockman and Fitch, Fitch in the Earth Made New. Do you remember that vision? Okay, well, Brother Fitch was a faithful Millerite preacher. He died before October 22, 1844. But we know he's going to be in heaven. He's a saved man because Sister White's seen him in the earth made new, right? So we know he was a saved man. And uh, in his church, there was this theological crisis going on in his church of that day and age. And he was being accused of perfectionism because he believed that the Bible taught that we can have perfect, victorious Christian living through the power of the Holy Spirit right here and now. And his church thought that was fanaticism and they were disfellowshipping him. And he wrote two letters in the disfellowshipping process to his church that, that now have been printed in a couple different, in different books under a couple different titles. Um, the first title was Sin Shall Have No Dominion Over You, and I forget the second title. But they're, they're some of the best arguments on victorious living that you're ever going to find, and they were written before Ellen White was saying anything. It's strictly from the Bible, and it's, it's just some of the most powerful presentations you'll ever come across. And so when you go into this book, he discusses this theological crisis that's going on in the environment of the Millerite movement. And um, the teaching that you could not have victorious living, opposed to Fitch's position that Christ could provide the power for victorious Christian living. Do you know what the Millerites called this teaching that opposed the possibility of having victory over sin here and now? You know what it was called back then? this teaching that denied the truth that we could have victorious living, what was it called back in the middle right time period? It's called New Theology. <laughs> you ever heard of New Theology and Adventism here at the end of the world? I mean, there, there is so many things about the middle right time period, brothers and sisters, that is, it's the same. Now, one of the things about the middle right time period that I, that I want to point you to is that Sister White confirms the Millerites understood. Let me say one more thing before I lead into it. After October 22nd, 1844, this book points out, very good points on pointing this out, that as the, those that remained true and faithful started trying to figure out what went on with the disappointment, and they started studying the Bible, do you know what they referred to over and over again? That if I come with my position on this subject and you come with your position on this subject... What they were using as a rule to help them figure out whether he or I was right or we were both wrong was the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller. William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation were the standard and they were all familiar with them and they used them for a point of reference. And if you look at it very closely, Sister White endorses those rules. Those were rules that the Lord led William Miller to understand they were rules that were identified during that time period, especially for that time period. What was, what was the most well-known rule of William Miller? Year-day principle. 
Where is the first place we find the year day principle in the Bible? Is it in, in Numbers? Who wrote Numbers? Moses. So the year-day principle of Bible prophecy has been in history since Moses. But the year-day principle of Bible prophecy became present truth in the Millerite time period. It was always truth, but in the Millerite time period, that rule of Bible prophecy that had been in existence for hundreds of years suddenly become present truth. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that I believe that at the end of the world, when this Millerite time period is repeated again to the very letter, that there will be certain rules of Bible prophecy that are recognized that by God's people that are present truth rules for this time period for this message. Fulfilled to the very letter. I'd, I'd like to share one with you that I think qualifies. It's called triple application of prophecy. Triple application of prophecy is this. Upon the testimony of two, things shall be established. There are some prophecies in the Bible that are repeated three times. And when you take the first fulfillment and combine it with the second fulfillment, upon the testimony of two, a thing is established, you will define the third fulfillment. You want me to give you an example of one? We've already had it. The three Elijahs. When you take the characteristics of the first Elijah and you combine it with the characteristics of the second Elijah, you've defined the third Elijah. You've seen it. You were all thinking, yeah, I get it. It was easy to see, wasn't it? I'm, what I'm suggesting is not only is it easy to see, I'm suggesting that this is one of the prophetic understandings that God's people need to recognize at the end of the world to correctly understand the prophetic message of the hour. Our message is the fourth angel's message, is it not? The fourth, that's, fourth angel's message of Revelation 18 is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. If you want to explain the fall of modern Babylon, you go back to when the Tower of Babel fell the first time and you combine that with the fall of Babylon with Belshazzar and upon the testimony of those two falls of Babylon, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, then you've defined the characteristics of the fall of modern Babylon. It's right there in the very message that we understand is our message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is, this is a rule of Bible prophecy that has been specifically identified in the scriptures. The first thing that pioneers understood to help them understand who and what they were in the world was the story of Elijah. Elijah the first plus Elijah the second defines the third Elijah. Now, when you take these two testimonies, these two witnesses to establish a truth, the way marks need to be the same. They don't always have to have all the way marks. What do I mean by way marks? On a prophetic line, a way mark is one of these historical events. If a prophetic line has 10 way marks and you bring another prophetic line to put over the top of this, line upon line, line upon line, the second prophetic line doesn't have to have all 10 way marks. It's okay if it only has two or or, or four or whatever. What is essential is that the sequence is correct. They ha you have to have the same sequence. If you bring a prophetic line together with another prophetic line, and this way mark comes before this way mark, and in the second pra prophetic line they're reversed, you know you're doing something wrong. Something's not right. The sequence will always be the same, but they may not possess all the same number of waymarks, historical points. Another thing is, is that the waymarks that do line up, they may not be identical. But there will be a truth connected with their differences. As an example, in the two Elijahs, did the king in the two Elijah stories want to arrest the Elijahs? Did King Ahab want to arrest Elijah the first? Did he? He was looking for him, but he did not arrest him. He was trying to arrest him. But he did. You probably didn't hear that I asked, did he? But did, did Herod want to arrest John the Baptist? Did he? Yes. Did Elijah die? No. Did John the Baptist die? See, John the Baptist, Elijah are the same way, Mark, conveying the same message, 
But they're different. There's, but there's a truth in their difference. What's the truth in their difference? The obvious, easy one to see is that Elijah and John the Baptist represent God's people at the end of the world. And some of the God's people at the end of the world are not going to die. Whereas some of God's people at the end of the world, they're going to get laid to rest. So the way marks, they need to be in the right sequence. But they don't necessarily always have to have the identical characteristics. But the differences in those characteristics only add light to the prophetic lines of truth. So, this rule of Bible prophecy that we're calling a triple application of prophecy, it's based upon the principle in the Word of God that upon the testimony of two things established. And when you look at Bible prophecy, you find when you come to the subject of Rome, this is, a, this is another point to a triple application of prophecy. The triple application of prophecy that I've recognized, and I don't know that I've rec- doubt that I've recognized them all, they all have something to say about Rome, about modern Rome. Um, the triple application of prophecy that's found in God's word is based upon the principle, upon the testimony of two things established. So the first fulfillment and the second fulfillment combined define the third fulfillment and they tell you something about Rome. The two Elijahs, the three Elijahs, give us the characteristics of modern Rome. A civil power with an impure church and a deceiving power. This is, this is the way to define who the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet are. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. There's much that can be, be uh, illustrated there. But I want to show you another triple application of prophecy. If you turn to page 98, there are three Romes. Pagan Rome and Papal Rome define modern Rome. Triple application of prophecy, dealing with Rome based upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. This is not all the parallels of pagan Rome and papal Rome. This is just many of them. Was pagan Rome and papal Rome persecuting powers? Yes. Is modern Rome going to be a persecuting power? Yes. Pagan Rome and papal Rome, were they both desolating powers? Yes. They both trampled down the sanctuary. Was the head of pagan Rome's title the same as the title for the head of papal Rome? Yes. What's the head of modern Rome's title going to be? Pontifus Maximus. Um, What was the religion of pagan Rome and what was the religion of papal Rome? It's paganism. Either case, except papal Rome covers it with the profession of Christianity. The more I personally come to understand about Christianity, the more it disgusts me when people say that Catholicism is a Christian institution. It's just, there's no way. There's nothing Christian about about it. It's pagan, just like pagan Rome was, just like modern Rome is. Was pagan Rome and papal Rome sun worshippers? They both trampled down the sanctuary. That's what this abomination of desolation in AD 70... uh, By the way, brothers and sisters... Another triple application of prophecy. If you're in the center of the page where it says abomination of desolation in AD 70, abomination of desolation in the year 1260, another triple application of prophecy that, Lord willing, we're going to look at a little bit, but I'm going to point you forward to it here. There's three abominations of desolation. The first was pagan Rome in AD 70. Sister White confirms this in uh, the great controversy that when pagan Rome came to Jerusalem in that time period. That was a fulfillment of Matthew 24, 15, where, just, where Jesus said um, that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel the prophet, you need to flee out of Jerusalem. It was a, it was a sign that it's time to flee. And in AD 66 through 70, pagan Rome fulfilled that prophecy. But the papacy fulfilled that prophecy in the 1260 years of papal rule. And we'll show you that. And both those put together give you the characteristics of the third fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, which Sister White speaks about. What's the, the, the sign of the abomination of desolation for God's people at the end of the world? It's the Sunday law. There's a triple application of the abomination of desolation. And when you take the first two fulfillments, eighty seventy 70, and the Dark Ages, and you look at the characteristics of those two, two, first two fulfillments, you will define the characteristics of the third fulfillment. And uh, one of the characteristics of AD 66 to AD 70 is that pagan Rome came around Jerusalem, surrounded it, 
And then what did it do unexpectedly? It withdrew. And brothers and sisters, the abomination of desolation arrived in the United States as a sign in 1888 at the Blair Bill. But Rome mysteriously withdrew. When it comes back, it's too late. In 1888, that sign was a sign of what, according to the spirit of prophecy? It was, yeah, it's placing the standard in a place where it ought not, in a sacred ground, the glorious land the Constitution of the United States. And that was a sign to do what? To get out in the country. Are you living in the city? Are you living in the city? We're we're beyond borrowed time. After 1888, Sister White didn't point forward to a time when we were to get in the country. She started identifying that we were no longer to be in the cities. This is my message. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 Spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. Sister White does not contradict herself. She, from 1888 onward, she says, my message is out of the cities. Pagan Rome represents statecraft. Papal Rome represents churchcraft. And when you bring those two together, it's emphasizing the combination of church and state at the end of the world that, that takes place in the threefold union. Um, pagan Rome had a time prophecy identifying how long the, it would rule the world supremely. Daniel eleven twenty four. it would rule for a time, 360 years. Papal Rome had a time prophecy identifying how long it would rule the world supremely. The important point here for me is that both those time prophecies begin when the third geographical area identified in prophecy is overcome. The third geographical area identified in prophecy for pagan Rome was Egypt, which was conquered by pagan Rome at the Battle of Actium in 31 B.C., and then it began to rule the world supremely. The third geographical area for the papacy was the Goths. In March of 538, they fled the city of Rome, and the papacy began to rule supremely for 1,260 years. The deadly wound for modern Rome will be fully and completely healed when it conquers the third geographical obstacle. Its first was the King of the South, the Soviet Union, and went down in 1989. The next is the glorious land, the United States. It's on the horizon. And then comes the United Nations, which comes shortly thereafter, because Sister White says the final movements are rapid ones. And when the ten kings agree to give their kingdom unto the beast, the deadly wound is healed, and the bloodbath begins. And pagan Rome and papal Rome are both a counterfeit of Jerusalem. They both had time prophecies. Did Jerusalem have a time prophecy connected to it? Yeah. And and once the time period was over, was the the city over? Yeah. It's it's a counterfeit. Of course, we know the papacy is a counterfeit. So, um, next page is the three geographical areas we were just mentioning. Um, okay, time checks seven minutes um, in this in Adventism today a lot of us believe the deadly wound was healed in 1929 at the Lateran Treaty when Mussolini gave the civil authority back to the papacy in the deadly, heal, deadly wound was delivered in 1798 when the papacy was forced to cease to be a civil power and it was removed from the city of Rome. And that's where the deadly wound is delivered. So the logic there is that when the papacy re- re- received civil authority once again in 1929 that the deadly wound is healed. But this isn't correct. It's not correct. Bible prophecy identifies that the papacy doesn't rule supremely until it overcomes the third geographical obstacle. Pagan Rome, papal Rome, defined modern Rome. The third geographical obstacle for modern Rome is Egypt in verses 42 and 43. 1929 was well before verse 40, which was fulfilled in... in 1929 was well before verse 40, which was fulfilled in 1989. But there is, there is a prophetic truth to this. In, in 1929, the papacy did receive civil authority about, back, and that is a partial fulfillment of... The healing of the deadly wound. But remember Revelation 13.2. Revelation 13.2 says the dragon, pagan Rome, gave three things to the papacy. Its power, seat, and its authority. It gave its authority to the papacy in the year 533. But it wasn't for another five years. 
until the Goths were removed from the city of Rome, till the third geographical obstacle was overcome, that it could begin to exercise that civil authority. So in the history of Rome in Revelation 13, 2, yes, the papacy receives its civil authority at a point in time, but it's, it's somewhere after that point in time where it's back in the position where it's empowered in 538. And it's the same at the end of the world. The civil authority was given back to the papacy in 1929, but it hasn't overcome the Goths. It hasn't overcome Egypt yet. When it does overcome Egypt, then it's able to exercise that authority. And that's what Sister White says. Sister White doesn't ever say the deadly wounds healed when it receives its civil authority. What does Sister White say more than once? It's when the papacy has the ability to persecute again that its deadly wound is healed. It has to not only have the civil authority under its control, it has to be in a position where it can kill the heretics. So the argument in Adventism, the deadly wounds healed in 1929, is there's a, there's a certain amount of truth to it, but they haven't looked at the history of Rome, nor have they looked closely at verses 40 to 45. Um, that's what these notes are as we, we close this up. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, <clears throat> as we look at the, the light that you've left recorded in your word for this day and this hour, we're amazed at the simplicity but the depth that you can convey in these, these simple but profound truths. And we realize that as Laodiceans here at the end of the world, we need to be awakened and very rapidly come to understand these things in a way that we can be wise and winning souls to your kingdom. We ask that you would bless us with wisdom from on high that would allow us to accomplish this work in ourselves, that we might be about the business of participating and helping others to accomplish this work. We ask that you continue to be with us throughout the rest of this day. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.